Good evening. I'm Rebecca Hawthorne, president of the League of Women Voters, Wyzetta, Plymouth area. I'd like to welcome our candidates, our audience, and our viewers to tonight's forum on behalf of the League. The League of Women Voters is a 102-year-old volunteer nonpartisan organization that encourages the informed and active participation of citizens in government. We work to increase understanding of major public policy issues and influence public policy through education and advocacy. The League does not support or oppose any political party or any candidate. The views expressed in tonight's forum are those of the candidates, not those of the League of Women Voters. It is our purpose in sponsoring forums such as this to provide you with an opportunity to hear candidates discuss face-to-face -face the issues that are important to you. And now I would like to introduce your moderator for this evening, Melissa Muslinger of the League of Women Voters, Wyzetta, Plymouth area. Good evening. Tonight's forum is provided to give you the opportunity to learn about the candidates running for the West Tonka School Board. There is never enough time to cover all of the issues in a setting such as this. If your questions were not addressed, feel free to contact the candidate directly. Recordings of this event, whether in person or by computer, may not be used without the express written approval of the League. The League will only allow audio video of this event to be broadcast in its entirety, except by the media reporting on the event. The rules for this evening's forum are as follows. Candidates will be allowed an opening statement with a maximum of one minute to state their experiences, platform, and objectives. A question and answer period will follow the opening statements. The answers will be confined to one minute unless designated by the moderator. Opening statements will be given in alphabetical order and questions will be asked and answered in a rotating order. A 15 second warning will be given to the candidates. The candidates will also be given a two minute, two minute closing statement. Candidates, please finish your sentence quickly when you see the stop sign or you will be interrupted. No reference of a personal nature will be tolerated. A person's public record may be examined, but not their character. This forum is made available to encourage the voting public to focus on the issues and not on personalities. We ask that there be no demonstrations in support or opposition to the candidates or their positions and that the candidates be allowed their full time to get their points across. The public has been encouraged to submit questions online in advance. And for those of you in the audience, if you have a question, please write it on a three by five card available from one of our volunteers and raise your hand to pick it up and then they will bring it up to me. Questions that are unclear, hostile, or of a personal nature will not be used. And those that fall in the same general area may be consolidated. Uh, at this point, I would ask that you all please silence your phones if you haven't already. The candidates running for three West Tonka Independent District 277 school board seats are Brian Carlson, Lauren D. Davis, Katie Holt, Rachel Myers, Kathleen A. Olesinski, Gregory Snyder, and Gary Wolner. We will begin with Brian Carlson to give his introductory remarks. Thank you, appreciate it. Hi everyone, my name's uh, Brian Carlson. I've been on the West Tonka School Board for four years. My wife, Molly, has uh, worked as a teacher in the high school for 22 years, actually. She's also been a coach for 21 years. I have two children, a son named Jack and a daughter named Maddie. Maddie's 13. She attends Grandview. My son, Jack, goes to Shirley Hills. Uh, a lot of times I'm asked, why did you decide to join the school board? And uh, four years ago, well, actually six years ago when we moved here, six and a half or so, we came here specifically because of the schools. And... Once we got in the district and we started interacting with families and we saw how positive the school environment was, 
I sort of felt like I was missing out and I really wanted my opportunity and chance to be as involved as everyone that was around me. And so that's when um, I actually, at one point, there was a opening school or position that I signed up for. Um, I, I was not picked by the school board, but then I ran for election and was, was elected to the board. And um, it's been nothing but a pleasure and an honor to be on the school board and serve with my fellow members. And I look forward to being able to do that again in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Lauren Davis. Hi, I'm Lauren Davis. Um, I'm a Mound graduate myself, have three sons who have graduated. Many of you know me as a pastor in the community. I've been at Good Shepherd Lutheran for 28 years. And since I preach uh, service to the members at the church, this is one way I serve in the community. I also serve uh, on the West Tonka Food Shelf Board and as a volunteer chaplain for the uh, Orono and Minnetrista Police Departments. I'm very proud to be a part of this board. I've served for eight years. I'm proud to work with Brian and Gary and the rest of the board members. Um, we've accomplished a lot in eight years. Just looking back through some, some old minutes today, we passed the uh, last year, the 2019 10-year operating levy that gives us financial stability for 10 years. Um, we passed in 2016, the big bond referendum that created the West Honk Activity Center and this beautiful performing arts center that you're in now. We've done many, many other things um, over the last eight years that I'm proud of. Um, we're in a contentious time now, but I thought it was important to run again uh, to make sure that we keep moving in a positive forward direction. Thank you. Thank you. Katie Holt. I am Katie Holt. Uh, this is my first time talking on a microphone. So <laughs> um, I've got a seventh grader at uh, Grandview and a fourth grader at Shirley Hills back there in the, audi in the audience. Um, <clears throat> we're uh, fairly new to the district. We moved here almost five years ago. I have spent time uh, volunteering at Shirley Hills for different things, PTA and, and um, field trips and classroom volunteer and things like that. <clears throat> uh, we too moved to Mound partly for the school district. So um, obviously to be close to the lakes, but when we found a house that we liked, my husband actually went door to door to the neighbors on the street and asked them about the school and everybody had great things to say. So we uh, felt like we had found our spot and we have really enjoyed our time um, in the West Tonka School District so far. Thank you. Next, Rachel Myers. Hi there, Rachel Myers. Um, thank you to the League of Women's Voters for hosting uh, and also to all the candidates up here. There's one thing I've learned very quickly. It's this is very difficult um, just to put yourself out there. So I applaud everyone up here for um, standing up and running. Um, a little bit about me. My family and I moved here um, two and a half years ago. My husband's from a small community, uh, Watertown, close by, and I'm from a small town in northern Minnesota, and we wanted to move into a smaller community. We'd heard really good things about the school district, and when we moved here, um, we were just embraced. I mean, the community has been so welcoming to us. The school district has been fantastic. Uh, we're thrilled to be here. I have a four-year-old who's in preschool and a 10-year-old who's in fourth grade. Um, they love the school. Even the 10-year-old who says he doesn't like school, he definitely loves school. Um, and I, you know, I want to run because I want to be involved in my children's education and I want to do my part to uh, contribute to the excellence that is uh, the West Tonka School District. Thank you. Thank you. Kathleen Olesinski. Hi, my name is Kathleen Olesinski. We've lived in Mound for four years now. We relocated from Ohio. When we started looking for places to live in Minnesota, uh, we were doing school district comparisons. So we literally chose to move to Mound just to be in the West Tonka district. I have two children. Uh, my son is in seventh grade at Grandview and my daughter is in fifth grade at Grandview this year. They both really, really love the district and they enjoy going to school here. I wanted to join the school board to kind of get more of an insight of what education looks like on the other side and how the decisions are made and then how these things are applied to our kids. It was, I'm looking at it as kind of like a learning experience up front, but I really want to get in and kind of add value as to what I know is important for those kids and what the kids are looking for on their end. Um, I, I'm looking forward to running. Thank you. Next, Gregory Snyder. 
Uh, thank you, Ms. Muslinger, uh, my fellow contestants, those attending here in the audience and those viewing from home. My name is Gregory Snyder and I appreciate your support for School Board. We moved our family to Mound in 2007 to take advantage of the high quality education available. Hilltop was ranked as number four in the state at that time. My two daughters have completed their entire education in West Tonka, each moving on to high quality universities. My son is currently in the 10th grade. I will say upfront that by and large, we've been very satisfied with the high quality education that our children have received. But in 2021, like many other aspects of our lives, educational curriculum and even boards seem to have become politicized. And diligent parents are now well advised to be aware of the changing curricula, history and influences as newer educational materials are being promoted, which could alter our educational focus and standards. Mostly, I think we need to focus on excelling in the fundamentals. I've spent decades participating in and leading state and national medical boards and I'm well versed in board function rules and etiquettes, will make, which will make me immediately effective as a board member. But but most importantly, I am a parent first and will do what's best for my child as well as yours. Thank you for your support. Thank you. Gary Wallner. Hi, I'm Gary Wallner. Um, lived in the district for 31 years with my wife, Lori. Uh, we have four daughters, three of which graduated from Mound. I have a daughter that's a special ed teacher up at Grandview um, and uh, uh, another one that's working on her doctorate right now. Um, in occupational therapy. Um, my other daughter and my grandchildren live here in Mound also and they attend Hilltop. I've been on school board for 12 years and during that 12 years, it's been an exciting time. Um, we've done so many things with the new Early Childhood Learning Center. Um, we upgraded our buildings, air conditioning where we didn't have air conditioning in two of the buildings for, for as long as I, I can remember. We built the PAC, the WAC, and, and, and we built a fund balance, which we never had before. So in looking at this, I wanna to continue to work and, and, and look out for the, the constituents here in Mound. And I hope to have another, another four years. Thank you. Thank you. And now we will begin with the questions. I will tell you who's answering the question and then who's on deck. Uh, so the first question will be Gary Wollner followed by Katie Holt. And that question is, in your opinion, what is one key strength of the school district and one area in need of improvement? Again, Gary Wollner, please. Thank you. You know, the strength of our school district comes in, in, our, in our staff. Um, I think we have a great educational staff here with teachers, administration. You got a school board that really works for the community. And um, in doing that, we're very, uh, very proud of being able to take care of and, and, and lead our schools in the right direction and having the right curriculum um, to help our students succeed. Um, I think um, what we're gonna have to work on in, in, uh, in the future is, uh, I think one of the biggest projects is um, coming up is space. Um, as our, our class sizes grow, um, we're gonna have to look at options of where, where we go, how we, how we maybe redo our structuring of our classes in our schools. So um, we, have, we have a lot of work ahead of us. Thank you. Thank you. Katie Holt, followed by Brian Carlson. Um, a huge strength that I really enjoy in the school district is just the sense of community. Um, my husband and I were talking earlier tonight about the homecoming game, the parade, the tailgate, and the parade, or the football game on Friday night. Um, my kids, and actually I too, love to see administrators and teachers and friends from school all gathered together outside of um, you know, the classroom and the daily routine, um, just enjoying each other, having fun. Um, so that's a, I think that's a wonderful thing. It's a smaller community thing. I never had that when I went to school um, in Egan. And then um, something that I would like to see improved would be access to information um, for parents or ease of, ease of accessing information um, related to behind the scenes, school board, things like that. Thank you. Brian Carlson. Thank you. So one of the things I've noticed is that all the other candidates up here have a common theme, which is they all chose and sought 
the mound or Minatrista area because of the school district. It's a very positive place. And again, we, as I mentioned in my opening statement, that's something that we ourselves chose. And I'm very proud to have been a part of the reason why people actively choose our district to come to because of the schools. There's a lot of reasons for that. Gary mentioned our staff. I'd be remiss in saying I don't agree with that, of course. Um, but also if you look at things such as our test scores, um, we have a tagline of small school advantages, uh, big school opportunities. And I really think that's something that's very true here. We offer a lot of diverse and um, uh, expansive options for all sorts of different people here. In terms of improvements, uh, facilities is one of the areas for me personally, I happen to sit on the facilities subcommittee here as part of uh, my school board work. And the high school in particular is an area where I think uh, occasionally we lose people because they come through and they, they wanna tour the high school and they see that it's a little tired around the edges. And if any of you have ever had a chance to go through and see some of the work we've done with our DECA area, you'll get a sense of some of the work that we wanna to do to the overall high school. And so that's an area where I think we work pretty hard to figure out how we can manage our budget Thank you. to actually invest in that type of- Thank uh, you. Uh, and the next you. speaker is Gregory Snyder. Uh, what, oh, pardon me. Thank you. I'll echo what the uh, other uh, uh, contestants have said in regards to the community and the staff. Uh, clearly, the staff is uh, outstanding. I think things that I would focus on when we look at the uh, proficiency scores from the grade school into the high school, there's a precipitous drop off from the 80 percentiles uh, down to the high school to 67 percent proficiency in math, 75 percent proficiency in reading. And although that puts us in the 10 and uh, 20, top 10 and 20% in the state, that still means one out of four of our students are not making proficiency in reading. One out of three are not making proficiency in mathematics. And I think more than anything else, that needs to be addressed. Uh, I think the, the responsibility of the school is to make sure that every student leaves here fully qualified to participate in life. And that will only happen with high quality education and improving those scores. Thank you. Next is Lauren Davis, please. Alan, there we go. Thank you. Um, I agree. I liked what Katie said about community. I liked what Gary said about staff. Uh, one other strength that I've seen, especially in this more challenging time, is the leadership um, in the schools right now. And I'm not talking about ourselves, the, the school board, but about our superintendent, about our assistant superintendent, Mark Femright, about the principals, about uh, the head of the community um, services, uh, Joel Dale, the head of food services, Laura Metzger, just a phenomenal leadership staff that our superintendent has put together that has really led uh, this district and the schools through this most challenging time. Um, as far as areas in need of improvement, I guess I'd agree uh, with the current board members that we're constantly talking about facilities and improvements that we need to make. It's just, uh, it's a constant, um, you know, the schoolhouse is in constant need of improvements like our own homes. Thank you. Thank you. Rachel Myers, please. Yeah, um, so strengths, I suppose I'm echoing what others are saying, the sense of community. I mean, we all feel very close, the homecoming parade, um, just kind of knowing everybody. Our kids run free, you know, throughout the neighborhoods and you don't even have to worry, which is wonderful. Um, you know, when I think of an area that I hear that we could improve upon, um, I've started door knocking and some of the feedback I've heard from members of the communities, they'd like to see a bigger emphasis on trades. Um, some of the uh, professions that don't require a four-year degree and are less costly in terms of education dollars. So um, if that's one thing I think we could maybe make an effort on, um, it's trades. I've been in human resources for 17 years and um, there is a dramatic shortage of individuals in the trade. So if we can incentivize um, students to look at trade professions and also build relationships with um, trade schools, I think that would be really good for our students. Thank you. Thank you all. Now we'll move on to question two. West Tonka has a safe learning plan for 2021-22, which changes the COVID mitigation protocols according to community spread, number of cases in each school building, et cetera. What are your views of or suggestions for the West Tonka safe learning plan for the 2021-22 school year. And now we will be starting with Kathleen followed by Rachel. I think that one of the things that makes these de decisions so difficult is that it's constantly changing. It's so fluid and everybody 
is very passionate about where they stand and what we should be doing at the school. Should we be going to school? Should we be wearing masks? Should we have our kids at home and should they be on remote learning? And is that effective? And it's it, because this is something that we're not going to be able to capture and just go out and take care of in any way. I think we just need to focus on what we think is the best thing. And best things for our students is to make the students comfortable, to get them to do to be able to learn in their environments and to be able to move forward. I, you see a lot of, um, my daughter specifically has some learning issues in school and it seems like the COVID has made those come to the forefront. So there are certain things that we could try to do to help her along. And it's really hard to within the constraints of the overall environment and just the ambiguity of what's gonna be next. Kathleen Olesinski, thank you very much. And now Rachel Myers, followed by Lauren Davis. Yeah, before I answer the question, I'll just say, gosh, the last year has been brutal, right? As a parent with kids in the district, I can't even imagine being a teacher um, and having kids in the district. It's been hard just adjusting to the at-home protocols. Um, um, I think our district's doing a very good job of trying to keep our students safe. Um, but I think what we've also seen in the last year is that every family is unique, every child's different. And I think we need to allow parents to have choices to decide what works best for their families and their individual students. So um, I think the most important thing for us um, as a school is to give parents choices. Um, I have a friend who has two children that one has no problem wearing a mask, the other does. So, you know, in certain situations, I think we do need to be flexible with parents to decide what they feel is best for their students. Thank you. Lauren Davis, followed by Brian Carlson. When we talk about the changes that are constantly happening, I've been comparing it to what happens when there's a snowstorm in the district. Our superintendent gathers data from the National Weather Service, from other local districts, even from the snowplow drivers. And then we make a decision based on that. And sometimes the snowstorm changes direction. Um, the same thing's happening here. We're gathering data from the CDC, the MDH, the MDE, other districts. We're watching our local numbers and trying to make the best decisions that we can to keep all of the students safe. If you look at the safe learning plan, it says the top priorities are to protect in-person learning, keep our students and staff safe, and provide all students with the best possible educational experience. We're trying to do everything we can to keep the students in school. And that has been the basis uh, for the decisions that we've made up to this point and will continue to make. Thank you. Thank you. Next, Brian Carlson, followed yeah. by Katie Holt. Sorry. No problem. Uh, I, I will just first say, you know, so often I'm asked about my own particular position on masks because that's a big topic right now. And I have to just say, I, I'm not a pro-mask person. I'm not an anti-mask person. I'm just simply a person who believes in rational and logical decision-making. And I think that we on the board here have done a very good job of, of trying to stay true to that process. And I completely agree with the things that Lauren said with regard to prioritizing in-person learning. That has been the whole reason why, and it's driven all of our decision-making because I think that probably many parents here and anyone out there listening who experienced distant learning knows that some of the children in our district who um, have to suffer through distant learning, those who have single parents, that is a pretty, uh, that's a large detriment to their life. And as a matter of fact, I would say, I think it's even more damaging than mask wearing in schools is these students who don't have the support system at home to actually go through a true distant learning process. So. Again, our decisions have been as neutral as they can be, as objective as they can be. We use data and metrics to prioritize in-person learning. Thank you. Thank you. Katie Holt, followed by Gary Wollner. Um, I agree with and appreciate the board's uh, priority to protect in-person learning. Last year was really challenging having the kids at home, uh, trying to learn, pretending to learn. Um, so I, I love that everybody is back in school and that's a priority this year. I also agree with um, Kathleen and Rachel that um, instead of a mandate, I would prefer parent choice where masks are concerned. Thank you. Gary Wollner. You know, when, when COVID hit, and we had to make choices on masking, not masking, yet half the people over here aren't gonna be happy, half are gonna be happy. 
it's, it was a no-win scenario. What we had to look at is what is the most important thing at this time, and that's to protect the kids and keep them in-person learning at, at the schools because there's not one single parent that's gonna be real happy if you have to go back to distance learning. I mean, I, I saw what distance learning did to my, my grandchildren and they were not the same people. We wanna keep them in school as long as we can. And if masking helps just a small percentage to keep them there longer, that's what we wanna do. Um, you know, I understand personal rights, um, and it, it was a, a decision made by the board to keep going that route of doing the mask. And we'll find out October 1st if it's working and, and if things will change. Thank you. Thank you. And you'll find the next question is a good follow on. Yes. I am so sorry that happens once every time I do this. So please go ahead. Shall I? <laughs> Hopefully okay. I got it over with now. I'm, so well, I'm, I'm glad to be the one time. <clears throat> Um, thank you. Well, I, I do appreciate that the school board did make an attempt to look at metrics and create a system. Uh, I think that uh, we could review the data and the way that the data was acquired and what data was used uh, and how that informed the decision. I think there's some room for, for scrutiny there. Uh, I personally think it should be a, a parent's choice uh, for their child. Uh, and I, I also think that there are definitely some unintended consequences when you put a mask on a child uh, all day long uh, as far as the sanitation of that mask and how frequently they're changing it, how clean the mask is, and if there are significant unintended consequences to masking children. So I think that all needs to be considered uh, as we look at masking our children. Thank you. And you'll be glad to know you're going first this time. <laughs> How can the school board support students, teachers, administrators, and parents in addressing the learning loss of last year? That's an excellent question. I think first thing we need is some, some specific metrics about where those gaps are. I, I think it involves identifying what the gaps are and, and then making specific efforts to uh, buttress the places where there are weaknesses. And again, I would focus on the basics of, of reading uh, and, and mathematics and science at, at potentially to, to some extent at the, at the risk of some of the social studies or some of the other things. I, I think that stressing the fundamentals is again the most important, making sure that everyone has, uh, is competent in, in reading and math, I think would be the most important things that we can offer as a school district. Thank you. Gary Wolner, please. Thanks. You know, when you had to go to distance learning, I think it was at a disadvantage for, for, for the kids. Um, I don't think they, they it, it's really hard to stay focused while you're doing that. Now, the latest numbers that I had were only from 2019, but in 2019, our overall district ratings were second in the state in math and sec seventh in the state in reading. Um, and I haven't seen the 2020 numbers yet. Um, on that, but I mean, the biggest thing is we have to come up with a program that's gonna give the kids what, what they need. And um, I think we learned a lot from the upcoming, from what would happen with COVID, COVID last year. You saw a big change when they got back in the school, they were much more vested in their learning and um, hopefully we can keep them there for a long time. Thank you. Thank you. Rachel Myers. Yeah, you know, I my son started doing some testing this week for fourth grade. I think it was reading, um, which I'll be very curious to see um, how his scores have gone compared to last year. Um, but I think testing will be a big thing. Um, I think he did lose a lot last year um, just because of the at-home environment. Um, so I think what we need to do is look at each individual student, see where their scores have either increased or decreased, and maybe come up with a plan to... Um, with their teachers to get them where they need to be um, so that they're learning at a level like they were before um, the shutdown where they were at home, uh, where there was some loss of education. Thank you. Kathleen Olesinski. I think that this is gonna be a huge undertaking and it's, it's gonna be difficult to determine what to do. And basically that's because I can see in my own household, um, my son actually excelled. He could do everything on his own time. He got it all done and he could move on. 
my daughter couldn't even pay attention to the Zooms. So as far as the disparity is, is what they missed, it's going to be really, really different. So where he is going to not have it really reflected in his scores or anything like that going forward, hers are going to be very, very, very different on the opposite end. So I think that it's something that we're going to have to do on an individual basis. I don't see how we could do it as a group approach. And it's going to take a lot of work from the teachers and the administration and the board to try to assess how we're going to help these kids that did fall behind. Thank you. Brian Carlson. I actually think the answer to this is a lot more straightforward than maybe we're giving credit to. The way to blunt the learning loss from last year is to ensure that we don't end up in the same situation again. And we do everything we can do to ensure that we have in-person learning throughout the whole course of the year. And I think that that's been the guidepost of this school board and myself this entire time. The, the other bit I would add to that is it's um, prior to the pandemic starting, we had some survey results locally here of our own students and their mental health. And there were some really concerning um, uh, results of that survey prior to the pandemic. And we've had a lot of discussion as a board, uh, as, long as, as well as with our superintendent on what we can do to address that. Unfortunately, all the energy around masking has really taken our eye off the ball and working on the things that we need to work on to really help and assist our kids from a mental health perspective, which I believe also helps with their learning as well. Thank you. Thank you. Katie Holt. Um, I fall uh, pretty close to what Gregory said, just putting extra emphasis on the basics, reading math and writing uh, to fill in the gaps where uh, a lot was a lot of advancement was lost last year. Um, and like Kathleen said, my two children um, reacted very differently to distance learning. And so there will be individual things as well. Um, perhaps there could be some sort of a program where parents come in to volunteer. I don't know and help kids individually if that's needed, but really the reading math and writing is, is my biggest concern. Thank you. Lauren Davis, please. Um, last Wednesday night, I took some fifth and sixth graders from our church up the hill to Dairy Queen. They liked that. And we sat at a table there and talked. And they talked about the testing they were doing in the first week of school. So when you answer this question of how can we support that, first thing we want to do is support the teachers who are already doing the testing at the beginning of the school year to see where the kids are in relation to last year and then support them as they move forward to help them catch up. The second thing is I heard from a number of candidates up here, they stress the individualized part that it's gonna to have to be for each child. You folks need to know that our district has been working for a number of years now on individualized learning plans for all the students at all grade levels. That's not something new in this district. It's something that has been worked on uh, by the school board for a number of years now, and we're excited about that. And that will help uh, these students uh, catch up. So thank you. Thank you. Question four. West Tonka's cultural competency plan states that the district will create an environment of collaboration, empathy, and one that values our diversity with a specific focus on equity and inclusion of all students. What are your thoughts on the West Tonka District Cultural Competency Plan? And we will start with Lauren Davis. Melissa, so I have that plan in front of me and you just, under guiding principles, you read the second sentence. The first sentence says this, we believe that the West Tonka Public Schools should be a place where all students feel welcomed, respected, and can succeed at their highest ability. I think that's important before you read the second statement about creating an environment of collaboration, empathy, and one that values diversity. Think again, as a school board, what we look at each time is how can we do the best to make our students feel welcomed, feel safe, feel respected, and learn or succeed at the highest possible levels. That has been and will continue to be our goal if I am on the school board. Thank you. Thank you. Gregory Snyder. Uh, thank you. I, I, I believe that the cultural competency plan was well thought out. The, the weak spots that I would see when I'm reviewing it is there's at least three places where it refers back to state 
guidelines and that's where i think we may not have as much control as we would like for instance if something passes statewide and now it's mandated for the school i think we as a school board need to be aware of what that curriculum is as it comes in and make sure that it meets our cultural competency plan so that was when i went through it there was three specific locations that referred to uh, state specific education so i would just want to make sure that as a local school board we're looking at what the state is presenting to us and making sure it meets with our uh, goals. Obviously, we want every child here to thrive, regardless of their particular situation or circumstance or background. Thank you. Kathleen Olesinski. Um, I did review the outline that was given to the school board on the cultural competency plan, but it was kind of really high level and I didn't see a lot of details in it as to what we were actually going to do. And I think that's one of the main reasons that I wanted to get involved in the school board is this, this is a big issue for us. It's a big issue for the state. It's a big issue for our students. And if you're outside of the board, you really don't know the inner workings of what's going on with this. So I did see the high level plan and I did see that it was going in the right direction, but I didn't see any details behind it, like what we are going to do or what our plans are or where we're going to go with this. And that's something that I would really like to make more community involvement in, and that way we could get some feedback of what everybody wants and where we should go with these large challenges. Thank you. Katie Holt. Um, <laughs> in addition to Kathleen, who um, I agree with everything that she just said, um, I requested some additional information on the plan of action in relation to the cultural competency plan, which I was told was not um, formed yet. So I think there's, um, there, I have a lot of questions as to how their goals are going to be implemented and what they're going to be doing. Um, there's just a lot, like Kathleen said, there's a lot more to figure out in how they're gonna implement this plan. Thank you, Gary Wollner. Thank you. Um, this cultural competency was just, what well, was a plan? The plan was brought to the board to okay a plan to move forward. There was no detail put into it and the board would have to vote down the road on what the plan plan would be. It was just a framework is what, what, what it is. And the whole idea there is with this plan, we wanna create an environment that's welcoming, welcoming and respectful and gives every student the opportunity to succeed. Um, and along with that becomes a safe environment. Um, like I said, there's a lot of work to do on this yet. We just have a framework and the plan is from there, we will be presented with an outline that the board would have to approve before anything else moves forward. Thank you. Thank you, Brian Carlson. Yeah, I, I just need to add on to that to say, I think hindsight's 2020. If we could go back and we could relook at the words that we added to there, the word plan is something that um, I think would, we would change because the idea of the word plan to me implies that first of all, that there's some sort of problem and that there's some sort of beginning and end. And I really don't think that was the intent of our cultural competency work or the people that were involved in those teams or the framework that we've established, especially if you read through a lot of the comments about it's sort of vague in general. That's, that's because that's what it was intended to be. It was meant to be a, a guidepost and help us have the proper lens and filter as we're looking through um, ensuring that every student has the best opportunity here at West Tonka. The other thing I'll say is, and I probably don't have enough time for this, but you know, the big white elephant in the room is the critical race theory. And there's been a lot of comments on social media. There's been websites created that basically are accusing us or implying that we are somehow implementing critical race theory into our curriculum. And I can just sit here and tell you that that is not the case. We do not do that. That has not been a discussion from anyone here on this board. It is not part of our curriculum. It is not part of our teaching. So if anyone out there believes that that is something Thank that you. we are pushing, it is not. Thank you. Question five. Mental health is a key issue of concern across the country and in our schools. Did I forget you again? Okay. Sorry, I, that's why I looked up that time. Next time, wave at me. <laughs> Sorry, Rachel Myers. You know, the cultural competency plan, not a lot of detail there yet. Um, it sounds nice. Um, I don't, you know, Brian called it, right? The white elephant in the room is CRT. Um, 
you know, I guess my thoughts there is we certainly don't want to ever, you know, identify somebody by their skin color or put them in a certain class or category based on their skin color. Um, you know, I think West Tonka does a really nice job of providing educational excellence for all of the students. And I think we should continue to do that um, regardless of anyone's skin color. If anybody needs any additional resources um, to get them to a higher level in terms of their performance, I think we should certainly do that. Um, but I, you know, you know, we just have to be careful, right? Some of the words with the cultural competency plan, you know, we just want to make sure that there's equal opportunities for everybody. Thank you. Question five. Mental health is a key issue of concern across the country and in our schools. How would you suggest our school district address the social emotional needs of our students? Rachel Myers. Yeah, you know, when I attended the last board meeting, I was pleased to see that the school has um, solicited the help of a um, professional from the University of Minnesota. I was happy to see that. Um, I think in the last year we've seen mental health, um, you know, on the forefront, um, especially with the pandemic and the impact it's had on the children. So. I think if we can ensure that the teachers have the resources they need to identify um, children in need of mental resource help and give them tools to um, have those conversations with the parents and also to connect them with um, resources in the community, that'll be really important. Thank you. Brian Carlson. So mental health, again, as I mentioned earlier, is, is a big topic for us. Um, and we've had to sort of put that to the side, unfortunately, because of all the uh, current situation and, and world that we live in. But I, th there's no one specific or clean and crisp answer to how you deal with mental health issues for students, unfortunately. I wish there was. Um, but what I can say is that uh, our ability to, to move on from some of these more temporary and minor issues and getting us back to sort of the business of running our schools, which one of those things is ensuring that all of our students are healthy, um, both physically and mentally, is something that I think over in the past we've worked very hard at. Are we always successful? I, I don't know. That's, um, that's hard to measure. Um, some of the feedback we've gotten from student surveys doesn't necessarily lead you in that direction and shows you that we have some area to improve. But um, the resources that we have to dedicate to it from a teacher, administrative, and financial perspective are something that we have to focus on. And uh, I, I hope that as we move forward this year that we can actually do that. Thank you. Gary Wolner. Thank you. Mental health is a huge issue and something people didn't like to talk about years ago. And uh, I'm glad we're partnering with the U of Minnesota to, uh, to put together a program here. We were able to secure a grant to help us uh, get this organized. And that I've known students firsthand that have suffered with mental health issues, be it depression, eating disorders, and it's just, it, it's, it's horrible to see. And um, it's something that they try to keep hidden, but it affects them both socially, educationally. And um, I'm glad we're moving forward with this, with, this, uh, with this program. And I don't know what that'll mean, if it means we have to bring on somebody else in our school district to teach and work with the, work with the kids, but that, that's what the whole study is gonna be about. Thank you. Thank you. Kathleen Olesinski. So I do know that there are certain mental health programs that are already existing in the district. My daughter participates in like meditation and some yoga and stuff like that, but she does that because she has interest in it and she expressed the interest. So there are the programs out there. I think it's really good that our district even has those because you talk to a lot of other parents and they don't have those types of things available to their kids. I do think though that the, the pandemic put everybody in like a tailspin. So these, these kids that had depression issues or these kids that have like the OCD issues and all, it was all magnified all of a sudden when everything was taken away from them. So I do think that we've created somewhat of a, a mental health deficiency now. And it's something that we're gonna have to reach out to our students and kind of gauge how we can help them and the best way to move forward with this for everybody. Thank you. Gregory Snyder. Uh, thank you. I, well, I think, uh, <clears throat> 
to echo what some of uh, the other candidates have said, um, obviously it's a very important issue. I think in-person learning will go a long way to helping address some of these uh, issues. Uh, but nationally, there we've seen an increase in in student age children depression, eating disorders, suicide across the board with with uh, at home learning or lack of in person learning. Um, I've got to be upfront and say I don't fully know all of the resources that are available in the school district right now. So it's hard for me at this point in my candidacy to have a strong program moving forward uh, without fully understanding what resources are currently in place. I mean, I can give platitudes and, and say I think all kids need to have good mental health and things like that. But I, I think it's one of the things we need to focus on. Uh, but I'm not in a position of authority right now to have a strong opinion on what our direction should be. Thank you. Katie Holt. While I think it is very important to support students' mental health, I believe the school's priority is to educate. Um, with, but with that being said, um, currently our schools have wonderful support staff and counselors um, ready to help students in need for mental health issues, um, like Mr. Locke at Shirley Hills, who I've had many encounters with. Um, he's been wonderful to both of my children, so thank you. Ready? Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, I read through old minutes to remember what we've done the last eight years, and one that caught my attention was January 2020, a year and a half ago. Kevin Borg, the superintendent, said the focus of 2020 would be on academic achievement, finance, facilities, and student mental health. While the focus last year, 2019, was on the levy, during the next year, the main focus will be mental health. So we've started that process. And as Brian said, we want to get back to that as a school board. This is a very personal issue for me. Um, as a pastor and a police chaplain, I've sat with families who have lost their uh, children, young adults, to suicide, uh, drug overdoses. Um, one of the reasons I wanted to run again after eight years was to make sure that we get this mental health plan going and uh, create more support for our students. Thank you. Thank you. What experiences do you bring that prepare you for the role of a West Tonka school board member who approves budget, hires staff, provides facilities, establishes, establishes curriculum, determines policy, and generally provides for the educational needs of West Tonka students. Katie Holt. Um, well, I guess just being a mom, um, <laughs> I've got two kids in the, in the school right now. And while I am not um, currently on the school board, so I do have some learning to do there. Um, my goal is to get more involved, to learn more about curriculum and the way the school um, runs and um, make it easier for other parents as well to access the information that they might be looking for in relation to um, those things. Thank you. Kathleen Olesinski. So I, en I enjoy doing things in the classroom. I enjoy going into the to my kids' classrooms and see what they're learning. We work on homework and all that other stuff together. I think that one of the main things is just bringing a sense of community to the board. So what I really, really want to bring to the board is an open forum where things are more uh, discussed with the community and there's more community involvement and more parent involvement. I kind of feel like um, a lot of the things that the changes that go on with the schools are just kind of passed down to the community as a whole. And I wanna be a part of that. And I wanna make sure that everybody else who wants to be a part of it gets to be a part of it. So that would be my main focus. Thank you. Gregory Snyder. Uh, thank you. Um, 
<clears throat> well, to echo to what my colleague on my right here has said, that I think it's very important to have a parental input. I think that that's critical. Uh, I think that school board meetings should be open to parental discussions. I think as a board, we have an obligation to listen uh, without getting agitated or having any sort of, of a commotion on this side as, as people tell us what their thoughts and needs are. Uh, personally, I've served as a president of the Minnesota Board of Medical Practice, spent eight years doing that. I, I was the uh, national chairman of the Federation of State Medical Boards, which is the National Medical Board. I uh, spent uh, 12 years traveling nationally and internationally, working on best practices, discussing best practices practices, have led innumerable boards uh, and committees and work well in that environment. Uh, so I think I can bring a professionalism uh, to the board, at least within myself, which would allow me to listen to uh, irate people with all sorts of different opinions without uh, losing my temper or, or judging or anything and still being able to synthesize the information that they're trying to present to me in passionate times. Thank you. Gary Wolner. Well, 12 years experience on the school board. Um, I've been very fortunate to be part of this, uh, this school district and uh, blessed to be able to be on that school board. Um, I've had 22 years of coaching. Um, I've been on the facilities committee, the policy committee, teachers negotiations. I really take it serious because I want our district and our students to have the best possible experience. And I think with that experience, I'm looking forward to four more years of being able to, to, to give that to the community. And as a parent, you know, I've been a parent for uh, my oldest daughter's 39. Um, you know, my youngest is 24. And uh, um, it's just uh, the, the experience as a parent and as a grandparent, I take that in consideration and decisions I make as a school board member also. Thank you. Thank you, Brian Carlson. I'm actually very excited that um, we have so many people who are now interested in the school board. I, I've been on the school board four years myself, and actually most of the meetings, I think all of the meetings with the exception of the past two, generally our audience consists of zero, meaning zero community members actually come out and engage, deliver feedback, ask questions. And it's something that when I first started, I was very hungry for. And um, unfortunately, many people did not come out. It's sad to me that masks is the one thing that rallies everyone out here to come and want to talk to us and find out about our candidacy, but if that's what it takes, I guess that's what it takes. With regard to my own personal experience, I've worked in the med device industry for about 20 plus years. In my role, I've had to be highly strategic, also be a problem solver. That's the same mentality I bring to the board. When we're given materials, we review policy, make decisions on our budgets. I try to ask critical questions, but I also try to be extremely positive in my view in terms of what are we doing to actually grow our district. And I think my experience as a spouse, a teacher and a coach, my experience coaching here, my experience being on other boards here in this community, my experience as a parent, as well as my board experience, uh, really lends itself to being a, a high quality school board member. Thank you. Thank you. Rachel Myers. Yeah, I think being a mom with uh, two students in the district really has me interested, invested. Um, additionally, I'm a small business owner and I uh, do HR consulting and I've been in HR for 17 years. Um, I think my experience there is that I've been able to work through a lot of really uh, different uh, environments with uh, individuals of diverse backgrounds, experiences, skills, um, personalities, and we've, I've been able to um, navigate through some really challenging times. In addition to that, um, I've done a lot of recruiting, I've done a lot of policy creation, um, training plans, um, so I think you know, being able to put all that together and work collaborati collaboratively, um, you know, is something that I would suit the board well. Thank you. Thank you. Lauren Davis. Yeah, um, I, one experience I have is that I was a student here. Um, through Went through Shirley Hills, Grandview, Mount West Tonka High School. I have had three sons that have been students here. I've served as a baseball coach, a youth hockey, youth basketball, youth soccer coach. I've been a Wolfridge chaperone and even one year coordinated the Wolfridge fundraising for a whole school. Um, I serve a small congregation that has about a half million dollar budget. So I do uh, financial planning and oversee a staff. Um, I deal with facility problems at our church, like we have facility problems here. I've learned that God's house is like any other house, it breaks down. Um, so I, I look at all those experiences, plus I've been here for 46 years of my life. And so I've part of many communities, a food shelf community, a church community, a coaching community. 
I get to hear from a lot of different people and perspectives on what they want for this district. And I think that's a valuable experience. Thank you. Thank you. Question seven. Please describe a situation in which you have successfully reached a solution to a difficult challenge with those who started with opposing positions. And we will start with Lauren Davis. There have been um, a number of situations. So one of the things that the policy committee deals with, it's a subcommittee, is student situations where a student has maybe done something that is inappropriate and you are trying to decide as a policy committee with the superintendent and perhaps the principal or the activities director what the best uh, uh, course of action is. And I know that on that committee, I've had at times, uh, uh, Gary's on that committee with me, we've not always seen eye to eye. Um, uh, other members on that committee, we've, we've had some heated good discussions and then come to a resolution that um, we believe is best for the student. I guess I can't be any more specific than that because those are confidential situations. Thank you. Thank you. Gregory Snyder. Uh, thank you. That's a difficult question. I think uh, I'll, I'll harken back to my uh, medical uh, experience. Uh, when I was the uh, chairman of the National Medical Board organization, uh, we there's a national doctor shortage and we tried to create a system where uh, a doctor licensed in one state could get an expedited license in another state provided he didn't have any or she didn't have any uh, uh, actions against their licenses. So it took putting together an interstate medical license compact where we got all 70 different regulatory units together to create a common standard which would allow us to easily license uh, one uh, physician from one jurisdiction to another. Uh, that took about two years and initially uh, we were told it could never happen but after some diligence and the strategy we were able to accomplish something and now the Interstate Medical License Compact is in full force uh, licensing several thousand doctors a month. So I think that would be probably my best accomplishment. Thank you. Rachel Myers. Yeah, I think about opposing viewpoints and I think about human resources because you're dealing with it all the time. Um, I think the biggest thing is that both parties are heard and have the opportunity to voice, um, you know, their concerns, their beliefs, and that, um, that we're able to separate the emotion from the facts and make good decisions based on that. And I also think, you know, when you have people with opposing viewpoints, you have to be able to collaborate together and um, compromise, you know, it, compromise is really critical too in um, coming up with solutions. So, um, you know, I can't think of anything specifically, but I just think about HR and um, there are always opposing viewpoints. So, you know, just coming together collaboratively and, um, you know, having both sides heard. Thank you. Kathleen Olisinski. I am a regulatory compliance specialist in the financial services industry. And with all of the scandals and everything that have gone through those, that industry, there are a lot of times when you have to sit down with a salesman and say, I know you want to sell it this way, but you can't do that. And there's not one salesman in the financial industry that looks at you and says, okay. So it's a give and a take. Both parties have to come be humble enough to figure out that they don't know everything about the other side and working together to find a compromise is usually the best manner to do it. Thank you. Gary Wallner. You know, over the last 12 years of being on board, there's been a lot of situations, not only dealing, dealing with students, but dealing with policies, um, teacher negotiations, we have to sit down and really work together to come to a decision. Not, the one thing I found is you don't always agree um, on everything as, as, a, as a school board, but when you treat each other with respect and you sit down and talk about it, that's when you come up with the right answers. And we've had a lot of situations, I shouldn't say a lot, we've had situations on policies and student decisions and you know what? we were always able to come up with what I think is fair 
And, and I try to listen to all sides when we're doing this. I mean, it's not just what information is fed to me as a school board member. I try to listen to what the student has to say, what other policy people say, and we go from there. And you usually make a really great decision. Thank you. Thank you. Katie Holt. Um, yeah, I guess the, the biggest thing is to just be able to listen to other people's points of view and to respond or speak back unemotionally and be able to talk through um, whatever obstacle you're trying to tackle and work towards a solution. Thank you. Thank you. Brian Carlson. The, the pandemic put a severe strain on our community education program. And so one, one of the areas in terms of a problem and a, and a solution that I was a part of was how do we maintain and keep our community ed program, which offers services like adventure club, youth activity programs, how do we actually keep that program solvent from a financial perspective? And how do we not have to decrease programs and services that the, the community education program offers? And so as part of my work on the financial committee, we've had to make some tough choices, but I think we've done a really good job um, and part of Part of my input into that has been able to help keep our community ed program operational and solvent uh, even through these difficult times that we experienced. Thank you. Question eight. It is likely that school funding may change in the next legislative session. How can the school board prepare for this? Please be specific. And we'll start with Brian Carlson. Well, the, the school board, I think someone mentioned earlier, we have spent a lot of time with our budget, making sure we have a fund balance in place to account for any kind of significant changes that come from the state um, that are negative to our funding, as well as any kind of emergency type situations that could occur, whether it's a pipe bursting in the high school, a roof leaking in the high school, or any other kind of um, major catastrophe, I guess, is how I look at it, that would prevent us from being able to offer um, learning to our students, in particular in-person learning. And so uh, we have a goal to maintain a fund balance of 8 to 18 percent, and we hold true to that all the time. And so um, without the ability or without our decision making that we put in place to ensure that fund balance exists, we wouldn't be able to deal with the types of changes that could come from the legislature. Thank you. Lauren Davis. One of the things I appreciate uh, about our superintendent and our uh, uh, financial uh, uh, overseers, uh, Kathy, is that they are constantly, if you will, crunching or looking at the numbers to watch um, what we're spending. Kevin is always keeping us up to date on what uh, physical projects are coming up next in need of repair or improvement, um, what negotiations are coming up with, with teachers or other groups of employees. So we're always uh, aware of the budgets. Kathy keeps us informed on how many students we have each month and what those numbers are and how that might impact our funding. Um, so I, I think what our, what we're, one of our strengths as a school board is that we are very, very focused on the financial aspects and on maintaining uh, a budget that is in the black and on maintaining a healthy operating balance. Thank you. Thank you. Katie Holt. All right, I'm gonna admit uh, numbers are not my thing. My husband is a financial advisor and I let him do all that work, but I have spoken with Kevin about um, the healthy fund balance and the work that the board has done over the last couple of years, decade maybe, to, um, to grow and to continue that healthy fund balance. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna let Brian continue to be on that finance committee or Kathleen maybe. <laughs> That's all I got. Thank you, Rachel Myers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I suppose the obvious thing, right, is staying close to the financials, um, keeping tabs of where the numbers are. Um, I'll take it a step further and say, um, paying attention to our enrollment. Um, at the last board meeting, it was brought to our attention that the uh, numbers in our enrollment have gone down this year. So I think we need to make sure that we're attractive to students within our community um, so that they attend the schools here. Um, because my understanding is that a significant portion of our funding comes from student enrollment. Thank you. Kathleen Olasinski. 
So there, there's a number of factors aside from the, the state changing our allotment that could affect our finances, the enrollment or any type of uh, school or emergency as far as our facilities. I think the best thing for the board to do is set up some type of stress testing so that we're testing to make sure that if X happens, we'll be able to recover. And we should probably even walk through the worst case scenarios just to make sure that we have that buffer that's available. So it's not after something happens that we decide we don't know what to do. I think it just has to be a well thought out plan and there has to be several different factors that are weighed in. Thank you. Gregory Snyder. One of the benefits of going uh, later is I can sound like a genius now. Uh, I do think Brian uh, was very eloquent in the way he said it. I think fiscal responsibility is pivotal. Uh, I think obviously focusing on enrollment and making sure that our schools remain attractive to uh, parents who might otherwise want to pull their students out for homeschooling is very important. Uh, I, I, for uh, across the board from what we would gain from having those students enrolled in our facilities and, and sharing with our other students and also to those students. Um, so I think, uh, you know, the levies we can't do frequently. People don't have an appetite for that. We're fortunate that this community has been very supportive of the school district uh, in, in buildings such as this, but uh, I think fiscal responsibility is, is a, a hugely important. Uh, as far as additional specifics, it's, it's very hard to answer that question without having all of the data in front of me. So I, I can't make uh, certain pledges or promises at this point without that information. Thank you. Gary Wollner. You know, 12 years ago when I got on the school board, we had just come out of a financial deficit and it was a devastating time for our school district. And two years into my, um, in, into my term, we already had built up a fund balance. We worked our way out of that situation. We built up a fund balance and we started to change the whole atmosphere where we had so many kids enrolling out of our school district and not as many coming in. Well, that worm's turned and we uh, have a lot more people that are staying in the district. Um, I work up at the activity center part-time and I was up there and it was sort of interesting people coming in from, I had two people this week that they open and roll their kids from Minnetonka because they had thought here, we have an opportunity and that's the atmosphere we have to continue to build. Thank you. Thank you. Question nine, what steps should be taken by the school board to help ensure school safety? And we will start with Gary Wollner. School safety has always been an issue and, um, and that has been at the, at the forefront of what we do as a school board. Um, we changed a lot of our entrances at the schools, how things are handled, handled there with people coming into our schools. I remember when I first moved here, heck, I could just walk in the door, walk down to the lunchroom without checking in. I mean, it was, it was, that's, that was the way it was back then. Of course, back then there was a train going through town too. So, um, you know, I look at it now and uh, um, you have to check in at the office, you punch in. Um, and it's, it's not just the safety of coming into our schools. It's a question of how do we keep the kids in a safe environment when they're not in the classroom? Um, and that means eliminating bullying and other things that go on. And I think we've created a very safe environment for our kids. Thank you. Thank you. Katie Holt. Yeah, I think it's really important that we um, continue the balance that that we've had since I have been part of the district um, because part of being in a smaller community, um, parents having access to come have lunch with their kids or volunteering in the classroom or, or helping teachers um, pull individual students. Um, I think that's really important and it's something the students, the teachers and the parents like. Um, I think we do a pretty good job with, with the school safety. Um, the, the biggest thing for me, I guess, is the, um, the locked entry and having to announce and check yourself in at the office before you start wandering around the school. And we already do that, so. Thank you, Brian Carlson. Yeah, uh, the word safe is sort of an interesting term these days. And um, I think sometimes we, in the old days when the, the topic of safety would have come up, we would have reacted to, people entering the school with assault rifles and how do we, how do we guard against that? 
Um, lately, one, one person's safe is another person's personal liberty violation. And so I think that we have done a really good job at trying to manage somewhere in between all of that. But what I will say is the way I think of safety in particular is uh, more around, does every student feel welcome when they walk into the building? And do they feel like they can actually come to a safe place at school where they can actually get a high quality education? And their safety takes many different forms, um, armed guards, masks, but also lots of other uh, things that teachers do on an individual basis, as well as the programs and services that we offer to make kids uh, and families for that matter, feel safe in our schools. Thank you. Thank you. Gregory Snyder. Well, now this time it worked against me because all the good answers have already been taken. Um, I do agree that uh, we do a reasonable job of making sure that the school is secure during the daytime. Uh, the, the ability to, to come in and out of an open campus no longer exists. I think that's a wise choice given uh, the, the uh, current environment in which we all live. I think uh, the anti-bullying campaigns have gone a long way to at least raise awareness of, uh, of what may be internal issues. Um, so I think just maintaining a diligence uh, about what is going on in the schools, uh, focusing on, on keeping a, a robust learning environment, minimizing uh, the, the availability and presence of uh, drugs or vaping in the schools, uh, things like that, I think will go a long way to keeping the children safe. And that's what I would encourage. Thank, Thank you. you. Lauren Davis. Um, yeah, as, as Greg said earlier, being later gives you a chance to think on what everybody else has said and I just really would concur. Um, we've taken steps of school safety in, in securing entrances and having people be see through a camera as they come in and having to go through a locked door. Um, Katie mentioned community. I think community is important in, in creating a sense of safety for our students. And it's just a matter of, of continued vigilance that you sort of never let your guard down and, and keep working on improvements. And then what Brian said I, about just having students feel safe. And so much of that is the welcoming presence of our principals, our teachers, our guidance counselors, uh, so many other people involved in the schools that, that make the students uh, feel welcomed and in feeling welcomed, feel safe. Thank you. Thank you. Rachel Myers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree with what everyone said, just that I think the school does a really nice job with, um, you know, making people feel safe. I would also say, I think it's important for the school district to have a closer relationship with the local police department. Um, I know we haven't experienced, you know, gun violence here in our community, thankfully, but obviously gun violence is a really big issue nationwide. So I think it's important that we as a district maintain a closer relationship with the police um, locally in order to um, have plans to respond in the event of a crisis. Thank you. Kathleen Olesinski. I think within the last 18 months, the definition of school safety has really changed. So where I used to be able to go to the schools for parties, or I used to go up and be able to help the kids read and all that other kind of stuff has all been cut out. And I think that we need to go back to the spot where the parents are allowed back in the schools and that the kids feel safe in school in, their, in a natural environment. I think a lot of the kids were kind of taken aback so they lost a lot of things. One of those things is having the parent volunteers or having their brothers or sisters come in and read books and things like that. And I would like to see it go back to the way it was because right now I think it's too heightened. Thank you. And now this will be our last question before your closing remarks. In your opinion, why should a parent or student enroll at West Tonka instead of a private school or homeschooling. And we'll start with Kathleen Oles Olesensky. I think one of the big things about being in the public school is the fact that you are exposed to your community. So my kids have friends everywhere that they go. They have friends at the football game. They have friends you know, down at the uh, pizza place. Everywhere they go, they know somebody and they have somebody that they can play with and have fun with. So the, the park nature and the playground and everything these kids build these relationships at school, but because we're a small community, they're able to take those out into every aspect of their life. And I think that that is critically important for their social development. Thank you. Rachel Myers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just think it's the sense of community. I think about our experience and the time that we've been here in the two and a half years um, that we've been here, it's just, 
it's awesome. The kids thrive in our district. They make friends. They see everybody out and about. It's just, you know, there's that community that you just can't replicate. And um, I went to public school myself. I believe in what the public school system has to offer. And I think, you know, we're a diamond in the rough, West Tonka. You know, we've got this small community with big school advantages. So um, I think that's us as part. Thank you. Lauren Davis. Um, you know, we, there, earlier there were some comments about, you know, having choice related to masks. Um, I, I don't agree with that because when kids come to the public school, we have to make a decision that's best for all the children. Having said that, I think every parent does have, uh, I respect every parent's right to make the choice as to what the best schooling option is for their child, whether it's public school or private school or homeschooling. I uh, personally am a very, very strong advocate of public schooling. I believe in public schools uh, in, in our state. Um, I believe that we do uh, have one of the best public school systems in the state. I have really enjoyed myself and, and for my sons, the small school advantage. Uh, my sons who are all average height, all played three sports at this school. They might have gotten one sport at a big school. So to me, it's, it is that small school advantage. I agree with that very, very much. Thank you. Thank you. Brian Carlson. My, four, my uh, fourth grade son named Jack came home uh, the other day and, he's, and we were asking about school and he said, I love school. Fourth grade is my favorite. And I was like kind of taken aback a little bit. I was like, really? Wow. Okay. That's awesome. I'm so, I'm so proud. And he, he exudes pride from being a West Tonka school member. I exude pride when I, when I said in my opening statements when we moved here so long ago, I decided to be all in on West Tonka. And I think it's the culture and it's the environment that we've created in our schools that make kids feel that way. And my whole role and my whole job is to make sure we have a lot more of the little jacks out there who come home and tell their parents, I love school and I can't wait to go back and who want to wear West Tonka swag and shirts and shorts and all the other things to show off how much they love coming here. And I think that in general, when people do choose to come here, um, they stay here because of that feeling and that pride. Thank you. Thank you. Katie Holt. I think there's a place for obviously all different types of education, um, but West Tonka, like everybody else has said, has a special sense of community um, that you don't get a lot of other places. Like I said, I went to school in Egan and my class was 525 kids. By the time I graduated, I didn't know half of them. I didn't know any of their parents. Um, being able to come into the school, volunteer with the, um, for the teachers in the classroom or go on field trips, you get to meet so many kids that you wouldn't otherwise have access to. And, and um, then when you're out in the community and you see them at the football game or the grocery store and, you know, you can kind of keep an eye out, you're kind of everybody's parent a little bit. Um, so that's, and I think that also provides a sense of security. Um, going back to the last question, but the sense of community is really a, the biggest deal, I think, with West Tonka. It's special. Thank you. Gary Walter. You know, the Mount West Tonka School District has always offered the opportunity for, for students to excel. Uh, not only are we one of the top ranked schools in the state, um, but the kids come here and when they graduate, they know virtually everybody in their class. I mean, that doesn't happen that often. And, and uh, you know, they sit there and they have a chance to take part in any sport they want to. They can take part in the plays. I think there's so many opportunities that are out there for our students and it makes it a great environment for them to come to and, 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 be, and be part of. Um, my grandson, um, it's probably a little over a month ago. They had moved here from Indy, back from Indiana a few years ago. He came up to me and goes, I love it here. I love the schools. I love my friends. When you hear something like that, it makes you think that they made a great decision and, and uh, they're happy to be here. Thank you. Thank you. Gregory Snyder. Uh, two words, White Hawks hockey. Uh, my kid's on the hockey team, and I don't think he could do that if he was homeschooled. Uh, well, we haven't had tryouts yet, so let me revise, let me hold back on that until we see how he does. Um, I would agree with what everyone said. Community is really the most important thing. We, we do have this benefit of being uniquely located where we are a small town within a much larger community. Uh, so it is very possible to go through town and know most of the kids that you see. 
and I think that that's something that's unique that you you get from socializing with everyone in the public school. Certain private schools are going to definitely have advantages in in some aspects or others. Uh, but I think, uh, by and large, I'm a public school guy. I grew up in public schools. I, I firmly believe in the public school system of the United States, and I'd like to see that continue uh, through my lifetime and into the future. So I fully support the public school systems. Thank you. And now we'll have the chance to hear your closing statements. And for this, you get two minutes each. And we will start with Gregory Snyder, please. Are we, are, are, are perfect. Uh, so I ran for school board uh, mostly because I wanted to become more involved in the community. Uh, my children have had an excellent time here at uh, West Honka. Uh, my daughters have excelled. They were each uh, got into decent schools, uh, decent colleges. My son is doing very well. Uh, I feel that this is a way for me to give back. Um, I, I have the time and the, and the intellect to look through the materials that we need to look through uh, to be an effective board member. And mostly I think I, I share in many of the values that uh, my fellow community members have. Uh, I'm responsive and open uh, to comment and uh, able to synthesize data and move forward uh, with what I feel is going to be in the best interest. Uh, CRT, not a fan. Uh, I'm also not a big fan of masking in, in the young uh, students. And I know that there's a lot of data on both sides of that argument. Uh, this is a personal choice, not a medical choice. Uh, I, I need to preface that because uh, we now live in a time where uh, my medical license can be jeopardized if someone feels that I've made a medical decision and wants to make an action against, the, uh, against my medical license to the Board of Medical Practice. So anything that I'm saying here is my personal choice, uh, but I am able to look at data and synthesize it. And I, I do hope that this steps we're taking do show positive effects. I think it's too early to tell. So we've had to make a decision on all of our children to mask everybody to protect potentially the, the one out of 10,000 who get sick, who then may have an un, un, uh, who may have a, a bad outcome. Uh, so I think that we also need to think about the other 9,999 who are being directly affected uh, while we're trying to protect that one. And with all of our teachers being vaccinated, I think we, we have, there's room for conversation on uh, what's the best approach moving forward. Uh, so uh, hopefully uh, uh, you'll be impressed with what I've said and support me in my candidacy. Thank you very much. Thank you. Brian Carlson. So for me, when I, I got involved with the school board long before the pandemic, um, was even something that was in our brain. And so for me, the word I think about a lot when I think about being on the school board is growth. And I think about growing our educational programs and services. And I think about in particular growing our enrollment. So then it becomes, well, how do we go about growing enrollment? And there's some very specific things, at least in my mind, that we need to do to improve um, what we already have that's already very good. And those are things like our facilities and fields. We've talked a lot about facilities tonight continuing to develop and build out our early learning program so that we can continue to attract young families and keep them here where their students are young and keep them all the way through the school system, um, as well as things like just providing high quality education and an overall positive experience for the kids that go here. Being on the school board is so much more than anything to do about masks or pandemic. It's, it, there's a lot of other issues and frankly, a lot of issues that are way more important than um, whether or not we have masks right now uh, for kids who K through seven. And those are the th issues and those are the things where if you're looking for someone who is focused on all of those larger level, high level issues for the school board uh, and topics, then then I'm the person that you'd like to vote for. If, if you're out there and you're thinking that, you know, I, I'm solely gonna vote for someone based on their opinion or stance on masks, then I would truly tell you that I'm probably not the right person for you. And you shouldn't vote for me to be on the school board because I don't sit here and run for school board based on, based on masking and the pandemic. Um, and we're going to get through the pandemic, we're going to move on, and then we can all focus on the things that are really the most important to us. So thank you so much. Thank you. Kathleen Olesinski. So I've been, I've been watching the school board and the process that they go through now um, since the beginning of the year. And I have a lot of respect for all of the current members, and I do really appreciate everything that they put into this board and what they do for the schools. I think the biggest thing that I would like to see is an increased community involvement. So while I sympathize with Brian, you know, saying the focus is on masks and the focus is on 
other things that aren't about education, I do think it's really important that the school board tries to bring us back in and tries to focus on those education things and tries to bring these things to the community. So, you know, there's several times where you see a line on them on the, the school board agenda and nobody in the community knows exactly what's going on. So like, I know that you made a decision about masks, but you didn't tell me how you got there. I mean, what did you do? What were you looking at? How did we get there? And I, and I think that's one of the huge pieces that anybody who has a child in the system is missing. We're missing the why, we're missing the, the voice, and we're missing some kind of a forum to be able to bring that up in. And that is what I would really like to bring to the school board. Thank you. Lauren Davis. I want to begin by um, thanking everyone. Thank uh, the League of Women Voters for hosting us. I truly thank all the other candidates up here. I've appreciated the discussion and I appreciate you folks out there in the audience for coming and listening and not falling asleep on me like people sometimes do. Um, I love the questions we've had tonight. I love being challenged and thinking about things in a different perspective. I love hearing the different responses from all the candidates. Most of all, I love working with the school board, uh, the current school board members that I've experienced. Um, th there was a comment made earlier about the school board politicizing things. What I can tell you is that politically, our school board is very diverse. We have people on the right and people on the left, people that like the current president, people that liked the previous president. But when we sit down to discuss school issues, we do not talk politics. We do not politicize them. We try to do what is best for the students. When we talk about the cultural competency plan, we've been working on that for over a year. I'll be honest, I didn't know what CRT was until this summer. I don't know if anybody else did. We did not embed CRT in our cultural competency policy. It's not embedded in our curriculum. If you hear that, it's just not true. Masks are a very contentious issue. Yes, there are some who are very much against masks and very angry about our decisions. But from the emails we're getting, there are some who are very, very positive about mass and are very positive about our decisions. Part of being on a school board is making those tough decisions. Um, I am very willing to do that. Um, and I believe that the school board we have currently, uh, we are willing to do that as, as a school board. So I appreciate your support. If you, if you don't agree with me, uh, yeah, elect someone else. Thanks. Thank you. Gary Wollner. You know, first off, I want to thank you for putting this on tonight. I think it's a great seminar, great people here talking, hearing a lot of different ideas. You know, in, in, in 12 years of being on school board, I take great pride in, 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 in trying to do what's best for our community and our students. Um, you know, I look at where, where we're at, how our curriculum's changed, how we've added AP classes, the percentage of kids passing them has, has gone way up. Um, I mean, when I, when I look at all, all the things that are happening in our community, we, we put together a one-to-one -one program where the kids have Chromebooks and Apple computers that they work with. I mean, we have really matured over the last, the last 12 years. And, you know, we're not going to make everybody happy all the time. I wish we could. Um, you know, some people, you know, want the mask, some don't. It's, it's split. It's, no matter what decision you made, you sort of, you're up to crick. Um, but the one promise I'll make to everybody is if I get voted back in for another four years, I promise to do what's right for teaching and education and the best I can do to make sure that every student succeeds. So thank you all for coming. Thank you. Rachel Myers. Yeah, I want to thank everybody for your interest as well. Um, you know, there's so many polarizing topics out there right now, but when I've done my door knocking, the biggest thing I hear from people is just pride in our school district, and I echo that. Um, as a parent in the district, um, I just, I want to get involved. I want to see what's going on with curriculum. Um, you know, the Minnesota Department of Education uh, was looking at doing some social stand studies revisions. One of their first drafts omitted key historical events, um, including the Holocaust. So I think as a parent, I don't want to be asleep at the wheel. For the children in our school district, I think it's important that we pay attention to what's happening um, with curriculum, um, you know, so that we can pay attention on the local level as well. 
um, you know, I think my background in human resources, working through very diverse situations with diverse personalities um, and perspectives will bode me well on the board. And, um, you know, ultimately I love our district and I love our community and it would be an honor to, to serve on the board um, and represent everyone in the community. Thank you. Thank you. Katie Holt. Yeah, my biggest motivations for running for school board, um, like I said before, is just to increase and improve uh, parents' access to information and involvement in uh, their child's education, whether it be at school or at school board meetings. Um, I do support parent choice where health recommendations or mandates are concerned. Um, but I also have a lot of interest in continuing to improve our curriculum offerings uh, focused on a well-rounded education. And I've heard from some teachers that they would like um, some increased input in what, what and how we're teaching. So um, yeah, I guess that <laughs> I could bring fresh eyes, fresh perspective and um, just add a current parent of students currently enrolled to the school board. Thank you. This concludes the West Tonka School Board Candidate Forum. If we can please show our appreciation to the candidates with a round of applause. Thank you also to the League of Women Voters volunteers, our audience here, and those viewing the event on cable and video for your participation in the forum. Thank you to the West Tonka School District staff for supporting this event and the Lake Minnetonka Cable Commission for broadcasting live, live streaming and recording tonight's forum. On-demand viewing can be accessed at www dot l w v w p a dot org and that stands for whites out of plymouth area please remember to vote in the november 2nd election by absentee ballot or in person your vote is your voice lwv welcomes new members both women and men visit our website again at www.lwvwpa.org Thank you and good night.